Good morning to you all. And uh, once again, I don't want to miss the opportunity to wish all of our moms a happy, a happy Mother's Day. It is a blessing to celebrate with our mothers. And what an incredible gift from the Lord each and every one of you is. And let me say this, what an incredible gift each of you is to our church. You know, all the ways that the mothers of our church here are a blessing to so many kids beyond their own. So we just praise God for you. And what a high calling you have from the Lord. Uh, it's a, a time to thank the Lord, especially for those of us who are husbands, uh, those of us who are sons and daughters, to thank the Lord. There's also a, an opportunity, and hopefully not a missed opportunity, for mothers to consider what a high calling the Lord has called each and every one of you to. Last week, we looked at Moses' calling, and I just want to quickly draw your attention to what God said to him. What did God tell Moses when he called him to a particular work? He said to him, I will be with you. And isn't that wonderful that for those of you who are moms, maybe today feeling thoroughly burnt out, uh, feeling thoroughly incapable, uh, feeling like you're, you're failing, you're trying to juggle a hundred things and you're dropping 99 of them and sometimes you feel as though you're dropping all 100 of them. What a comfort to you in your calling, in your vocation, and make no mistake, motherhood is one of the greatest vocations we have on planet Earth. What a comfort it is to you to hear the words of God when he says, I am with you. I will be with you in this work. He is with you, mother. He is with you in your calling. Like Moses, you may say to the Lord, even this morning, you may say to God, uh, God, who am I? Who am I that I can do this thing? Who am I that I could carry out this great work, this great calling of being a mom? And what's interesting is in the latter part of that passage we looked at last week with Moses, when Moses goes that route and he says, who am I? God reorients him and reassures him. God takes the focus uh, that Moses has on himself and his own inadequacies and he points Moses to himself, to the Lord. And so this morning I pray that in all of your feelings of inadequacy as a mom, in all of the ways that you feel like you're not measuring up and you are failing, I pray that you will look to the Lord, that you will allow God to reorient you and to reassure you that he is with you. He's with you this morning. He'll be with you all year and again next Mother's Day and beyond. The Lord is with you. Today we return to the burning bush scene in Exodus chapter 3 where God encounters, where, where Moses encounters God. And so if you will go ahead and go there with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. One of those great high point passages in the Bible. All of the Bible is wonderful. All the Bible is precious. But there are those unique passages. You know, we came to Romans 8, for example. We saw the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing, <laughs> the Lord's Prayer, and others that just really stand out. Uh, and Exodus chapter 3 really does have to be among those passages. So significant, so outstanding uh, when we come to the scope of Revelation, what God has given us in his written word. Exodus chapter 3. So the big idea from last week was the deliverer calls a deliverer. God reveals himself to Moses in a flame of fire. The bush is burning but is not being consumed. So this burning bush scene, God declares his holiness. He tells Moses that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he explains to him that he has seen the suffering of his people. God reveals to Moses what we already knew at the end of chapter 2, and that is that God has heard, God has seen, God remembers, and God knows. He sees what his people in Egypt are going through, what the Israelites are suffering, the oppression that the Israelites are facing in Egypt. God 
sees. So what will this God do? What will he do? He tells Moses he will deliver by sending a deliverer. That's how God will do it. He's going to deliver his people. I have come down to deliver them. And how? By sending a deliverer. And so we read of his call to Moses in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I will deliver. And then he grabs Moses and he says, come, I'm going to send you. So God will rescue, but he will use a human agent to do it. So just consider this morning. All the many ways that God uses us, human agents, to rescue people. To rescue people from eternal hell. Far worse, far worse than what the Israelites were facing in Egypt. God actually uses us, not that we save anyone, not that we really win anyone, but that God uses us as instruments and vessels and and means of bringing the power of his saving gospel to other people. And once again, we consider the role of a mother and the great task that a mother has being used by God as an instrument of bringing God's saving gospel to the next generation. So let me just ask you, mom, you might be making lots of sandwiches. You might be busy getting your kids to soccer or whatever else. You might be doing a lot of things, but is the primary thing happening in your home? Are you bringing the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to your children? Are you being used as an instrument of deliverance in the lives of these precious little souls? How amazing and unfathomable it is to consider that God uses us to carry out his great purposes. Today we come to verses 13 to 15, a a short passage. It, It is a short passage situated within the burning bush scene. It is a profound passage. It is a truly awesome passage. Just these three verses, verses 13 to 15 of Exodus chapter three. The title that I've given these verses is simply the name of God. And so that's the title For the sermon this morning, the name of God. So if you would go ahead and stand with me as we read God's word together. I'm going to begin in verse 1 just so we can have the whole burning bush scene up to this point. But our focus, as I said, will be on verses 13 to 15. This is God's holy word. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Let me just stop there for a moment. I made the point last week that God tells Moses, he's saying two things at once. He's saying to Moses, stay away, for I am holy But by calling Moses' name twice as a sign of intimacy, as a sign of love, he's saying to Moses, in essence, come near. So God calls us to come near to him, to belong to him, to know him, but also to always keep in view his holiness. Verse 6, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, 
a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And now our passage for today. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. You can go ahead and be seated. This is God's holy word, his precious word, his profound word. Let's go to him in prayer and ask that he would bless this time of instruction, that he would open our ears Open our minds, open our hearts. Lots of stuff probably going on today, maybe in your family. Quiet all of that. Let's be present here with the Lord and with his people, with his word. Father, we thank you for giving us your revelation. Lord, you don't leave us in the dark. You show us who you are. You show us what you are about. You tell us even profound things about your nature. Lord, you reveal to us your love. God, we praise you that you're with us this morning by your spirit, that your spirit dwells with your people in your people. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Deliverer who came to give his own life to save us. Father, we give you praise for Jesus the Christ. We thank you that he is the good shepherd, that he is the door of the sheep, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the living water and the bread of life. We thank you that he himself is I am. Father, we praise you that we get to gather this morning and be uh, be here together learning from your word, Lord, that these truths that are eternal they come from you and and we get to hear them read and we get to hear them explained to us father we pray that you would open our minds to this we pray that you would remove distractions from inside of our minds lord that we would not allow ourselves to succumb to straying thoughts like like little sheep walking away from the flock but that we would be sober-minded That we would be tight-minded and reverent before your face as we worship through our study. Lord, we pray for your mercy. We thank you that it is ours through Christ, through his blood. Be with us now, we pray. Thank you for one another. Lord, we thank you for time together as Christian believers, as followers of, of Christ, of the good shepherd, the one who's called us to be fishers of men. Lord, we are fellow fishermen, fisherwomen here this morning, Lord. We are so thankful that we have each other. Lord, we thank you for our mothers. We pray your blessings over them, and we ask that you would strengthen them, Lord, and encourage them in the work of motherhood. Whether their kids are little or in the womb or kids to be, Lord, or their kids are grown, I pray, Father, that you would strengthen them in their work and in their praying and in their modeling and in their teaching, Lord God, that they would not miss the primary task in the midst of all the little things going on in life. 
Would you strengthen them, Lord, with the knowledge of your presence and reorient them away from themselves to you? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've discussed before, names in the ancient world were far more meaningful than we tend to consider them today. I mean, the way we name kids today is very different, you know, than it was back in the ancient world. We, we are very interested in the sound of the name or people we know uh, who have that name. And oftentimes, as I was talking with someone recently, we, we have a name and then we think of someone in high school or whatever uh, who had that name. We're like, eh, never mind. I'm not naming my kid that. Uh, so we tend to think superficially oftentimes about how we name our kids and what we name our kids. And that's just been the case, I think. Now, not always, not always the case, but it's been the case, uh, I think, in, in the modern world very much. Uh, contrasted starkly with the ancient world, the name was something that expressed character and nature. And this revelation of God's name to Moses at the burning bush emphasizes three things about the Lord. God is not just saying, this is what you guys are to call me. God is saying, this is who I am. This is my very nature. This is my very character. This is who I am as your God, as the one true God, as the living God. So three things this morning revealed to us in this disclosure of God's name. First, we have self-existence. Second, we have presence. And third, we have permanence. His self-existence, his presence, and his permanence. This really is, uh, presents to us a depth of riches. So we could talk about, and in fact, people have written about, and discuss this passage for a very long time. So there are so many facets of, of glorious truth, riches here in this passage. But I think we can hone in on these three things that we learn here about the Lord. About our God. About the one we've gathered to worship this morning. About the one we have a relationship with individually. In our secret prayer room as we read in the Sermon on the Mount. The one we know and call Abba. Who is he? Who is this God? We learn quite a bit this morning about him. So first, let's look at his self-existence. His self-existence. The passage begins with a question from Moses. Look at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? I think there are two things going on here with Moses' response. Uh, This is Moses' response to God's call. This is Moses' response to God's response. Uh, God calls Moses and Moses responds to him, Who am I that I should do this? And God responds to him and says, I will be with you. And he says, "I'll, I'll give you a sign in the future. You'll come back to this mountain and you will worship. That was God's response to Moses. So here is Moses' response to God's response. And I think there are two things going on here. First, Moses doesn't really want to do this. Moses does not like this idea. When he heard, come, I will send you, he didn't get all giddy inside. Like Isaiah in chapter 6, wanting to be sent by God, the image of that, that zeal and that excitement and enthusiasm to go and to do. This is the opposite. Moses, that was, that was crushing to Moses. Uh, that did not produce in him a sense of excitement and wonder. It produced in him a sense of terror and trepidation. Moses does not want to do this. He wants to live out the rest of his days tending his father-in-law's sheep out in the middle of the wilderness. He wants to continue his quiet, peaceful life there in Midian. And so what Moses is doing is bringing forward soft objections. These are soft objections in the form of questions. And we all understand that. Uh, Little ways of poking a hole in the idea. Well, what about this? Just poking a little hole in the the whole plan. Verse 12, 
Who am I that I should go? That's his first question, his little poke, his little hole in this whole plan. Who am I that I should go? And then we get this question about the name. And this series of soft objections culminates in chapter 4 with very hard objections. So verse 10, But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And then God tells him, I made man's mouth. Who made man's mouth, Moses? And God responds to him. But then we still get more objection in verse 13. But he said, and this is just flat out right here. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Just, just, just says, I, don't, I really don't want to do this. This is not for me. He's run out of objections, so he just asked God, can I not do this? And of course, God is angered with Moses. God sends Aaron to go with him. And we know how it progresses from there. We'll get to that point. So the question here could be seen in part as an objection. This is Moses trying to get out of this very heavy calling very heavy calling, objectively speaking, but from Moses' point of view, is super duper duper heavy. This is as heavy as it gets. It cannot be heavier. So that's the first thing that's going on. Second, it is also a real question. So it is an objection, but Moses is asking a real question. If this is something he ends up having to do, and of course, he's going to do everything he can to get out of it. He's going to do everything he can so that it's not something he ends up having to do. But if in the end he does have to do it, what will he say to the people when they ask him, who sent you? Who sent you, Moses? Tell us his name. We know from Genesis that God had revealed his name to the patriarchs, his name Yahweh. God had revealed this name Yahweh very early on. We find in verse 15 this name, the Lord. And I'm going to talk about this more in a moment. But when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is a, a reference to Yahweh. That's a reference to the holy name of God. The very special, unique name of God that we find revealed in this passage, the Lord. And we'll talk in a moment about how that came to be. Why we, when we read it, we don't read Yahweh. We read the Lord. But we find this name, Yahweh, the Lord, we find this name before Noah. So interestingly, Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. To Seth also a son was born. I mean, this is right after Adam and Eve. Seth is Adam and Eve's son. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of Yahweh. That's what it says, literally in Hebrew. At that time people began to call upon the name of Yahweh, or in, in our English Bibles, the Lord. In chapter 9, verse 26 of Genesis, we see in the mouth of, we hear or read in the mouth of Noah, blessed be Yahweh, or blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And we see this also clearly in the life of Abraham. So Genesis 15, 7. This is what God said to Abraham. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So we see this name going back very early on prior to the time of Moses. God had revealed himself in this way very early on. We see it even in Seth's son. This is the third generation of humanity. Now keep in mind that the Israelites have been in Egypt for over four centuries. How much do they remember about the Lord? You know, think about that. I mean, these people have been there in Egypt, immersed in Egyptian paganism for over four centuries. How much do they remember about the Lord? How much has been forgotten? To what extent has their view of God been polluted by the neighboring religion? I mean, we know that this happens. You only have to read Judges and then beyond to hear all the ways that God's people, their religion, their, their trust in the Lord, their worship of God gets polluted by the neighboring 
people. So to what extent has this happened among the Israelites? Well, on the one hand, we know that the Hebrew midwives feared God. We know that Moses' mother's name is Jochebed. Yah, Yahweh. Jochebed, which means Yahweh is glorious. We know that Moses and the Israelites remembered to keep the promise to Joseph to take his bones out of Egypt. So if Moses and the Israelites, 430 years later after Jacob has come into Egypt, if they remember that little promise, that tiny little promise to take Joseph's bones out of Egypt, it's likely that much of what they had been taught through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob had been retained if that one little detailed promise had been retained. So that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, we see the perversion and confusion of the golden calf incident later at Mount Sinai. What in the world are they doing? Worshiping a golden calf in the name of the Lord. They're they're saying that they're worshiping the Lord and they've made a golden calf. That's suggestive of the extent to which The paganism of Egypt has influenced and affected their worship of the one true God. We know that it has been many years since God has spoken to his people. Hundreds of years have passed since the days of Joseph. So Moses' question, in light of all these realities, Moses' question is valid. How is he to introduce God? In a world filled with various gods... The names of gods everywhere. What is Moses to call this one true God? So now we come to God's response. What is God's name? Look at verse 14. All the way up through the first part of verse 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, dot, dot, dot. So God's name is the Lord. God's name there at the center of the passage is Yahweh. Verse 15 tells us this name is at the center of the passage and is represented by these all caps, Lord. Now this is called the Tetragrammaton. You don't have to write that down. But this is called... The Tetragrammaton, because it is written with four Hebrew consonants. This holy name of God would have been found in the Hebrew text with four Hebrew consonants. Transliterated into English with these four. Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. You you will see this sometimes transcribed just in English. Y-H-W-H, and that's it. All caps being the holy name of God. This is God's unique name in the Old Testament. This is his covenantal name as he is revealing himself here to his covenantal people, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people whom he will make a covenant with at Sinai. Most scholars agree that this Y-H-W-H in Hebrew was pronounced Yahweh. Yahweh. The reason it is printed as Lord. So that may be a question. This is going to get a little tedious, but I think it's important. So I'm going to to jump in. I'm going to go for it. So stick with me. The reason that it is printed as Lord, capital L-O-R-D, can be traced back to 300 years before Christ. When scribes, out of reverence for the divine name, began pronouncing it with the Hebrew word Adonai, Lord. We find the word Adonai all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout Genesis. We encountered that word quite a bit. Adonai means Lord or Sir or Master. So what these Hebrew scribes would do as an act of piety, as an act of reverence, is when they are reading through the Hebrew Bible, reading through these words, they come to the Tetragrammaton, and instead of saying the divine name, Yahweh, they say Adonai, Lord. This was picked up in the Greek translation where every occurrence of Yahweh was written as kurios or 
Lord. That is the Greek word for Lord. And so about you know, a couple of centuries, to, several centuries before Christ, the, there was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, of, of the Hebrew Bible, called the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, when they came to the divine name, the holy name, they wrote kurios, meaning Lord. And this has continued in English translations, and so we see capital L-O-R-D, Lord. The Lord part is a continuation of what we find going back before Christ, and the capital letters is a way of letting the reader know that this is not Adonai, this is Yahweh, that they are meant to understand. By the way, the reason we get the name Jehovah goes back to the time of the Renaissance, 500 years before now, when the vowels of Adonai were put together with the consonants of Yahweh. So because, this is kind of confusing, so the, the divine name was Yahweh, but it was being pronounced Adonai, so it's this kind of hybrid where the divine name, the consonants, Y-H-W-H, were put together with the vowels from Adonai, and it created this mistaken hybrid pronunciation, Jehovah which is not the way the Lord's name was pronounced by the Hebrew people. Most all scholars would agree. So that's where we get the name Jehovah, but it is Yahweh. So what does this name Yahweh mean? What does this name mean? And for that, we have to look at the context. Before introducing his name, God says that he is the I Am. Verse 14, I am who I am. Say that I am has sent me to you. Now, scholars have debated how to translate this, and I'm not going to get into all of it, but you'll notice in your ESV Bible, if you have one, if you have a different translation, there's notes there, I'm sure, as well. But in the ESV in particular, you will notice that at the bottom it will say, I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. These are other ways that this can be rendered. It has also been translated by commentators as, I will be who I am, or this is who I am, colon, I am, or I am truly, or I am, I am. (laughs) So these are all the ways, many, many more. I mean, there's so many ways that this can be rendered uh, to understand the divine name. But I think we gain insight into God's meaning by looking at how this was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, in the early Greek translation. This is the way they render it in the Greek language. I am the one who is. Now, this doesn't seal the deal, but it at least tells us how the Hebrew people in the Greek diaspora, in the Mediterranean world, it at least tells us how they understood what the divine name meant. And they translate it, I am the one who is. And when this is referred to in the New Testament, we simply get I am. So I think the Septuagint and the New Testament usage help us to understand, this is my point, help us to understand that that's the main idea that's in view here as we translate this as I am. In other words, God declares himself to be the living God. The God who truly exists in contrast to all the pagan deities of the name. Isn't this fascinating? God could have said, oh, I'm this and just some name. Some name. Or as he had done frequently in Genesis, he called himself the God who hears. Or the God Almighty. El and then fill in the blank. El Shaddai, for example. God Almighty. He could just have said his name as just any other ancient name. For a deity. But God declares himself to utterly transcend all of that. He declares himself to be in contrast to all pagan deities which are dead, which are nothing. The God who is contingent on no one, he is self existent, he receives nothing. His being and existence are one and the same. Just baffles our mind. Every other being has its existence from without. Beings created, given existence from without. Being and existence not one and the same. But God 
has his being, who he is, what he is, as being the same as his very existence he is. He is the God who is. This is utterly profound in the context of the ancient world. You find nothing like this in the ancient world. It, it totally, as I said before, transcends all the ways ancient peoples thought about their deities. It is unique. And it tells us that God needs nothing from us. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. God needs nothing. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about God as though uh, God was just so in need of our love. It's ridiculous. That God was so in need of our love that he, he did, he sent his son so that we would love him and he would be complete and he would be fulfilled and God would be whole. What? God doesn't need our love. God needs nothing from us. He is self-existent and entirely self-sufficient. Father, Son, and Spirit eternally forever as one in perfect harmony in need of nothing. God is love doesn't need our love. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need us, but he gives us everything. Isn't that amazing? He does it all for us and his eternal glory in our eternal bliss, in our eternal joy in him. Our eternal satisfaction in him is to the praise of his glorious grace. Not filling some void in God. There is no void in God. He is. I am who I am, he says. So back to the name Yahweh. What does Yahweh have to do with I am? The answer, once again, lies in the Hebrew. One could understand Yahweh to mean He is. Yahweh could be understood to to mean he is. This is debated by commentators, but this is a view that many hold. That Yahweh, the word Yahweh, is a form of the verb to be that has been crystallized as the divine name. So here's where I've been getting to. God reveals himself with the verb to be as I am. And his people confess him as Yahweh or he is. You see that? God says I am, we say he is. That's what's going on here. God says I am. Our response is he is. Praise God. So first we see his self-existence. Secondly, we see his presence. His presence. It is important that we see the context for this I am name. In verse 12, God says to Moses, I will be with you. Notice that in the context. We talked about that at the very beginning. In verse 12, God says, I will be with you. Well, once again, interestingly, the Hebrew word for I will be is the same in verse 12 that we find in verse 14 for I am. So you can't miss that. The reader, the original reader of this text would have seen that. Verse 12, they didn't have the verses, but they would have read in our verse 12, I am with you. And they would have seen the same Hebrew word that they then find a moment later when God declares himself to be the I am. What's the point? God is not simply revealing himself as the transcendent God who is. This is not mere philosophy. This is not mere uh, just contemplating the divine essence. This is not just an abstraction from reality. This is not just God is way up there and we are way down here. Whoa. That's not what we have in this revealing of God's name. He is not merely revealing himself as the transcendent God, the self-existent, eternally infinite God as the infinite creator of all, created by no one, needing no one. All that is there. All that must be there. But that's not it. God is not just declaring his transcendence. He is also declaring his eminence. 
by revealing himself as I am, in the context of telling Moses, I will be with you, he is making a statement. Listen to this. God is making a statement about his presence. He's making a statement about the divine presence. God will always be with his people. He was with the patriarchs, verse 15, as the Lord the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And it's interesting, Jesus refers to this passage to say, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus refers back to this revelation of God's name to say that God is presently with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or, or better yet, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are presently with God. He was with the patriarchs, he still is. He has been with the sons of Israel through the entirety of their Egyptian slavery, and he will be with them now as he brings them out of Egypt and into the promised land. So question, what is the most obvious display of God's presence with his people? The most obvious display that God has given us of his presence with his people, well, obviously, it is the incarnation of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. God himself became man, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, the incarnation of the Son of God. When has God shown himself to be most present with his people in the person of his son. God became man and dwelt among us as Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is why Jesus refers to himself as the I am. We read that a moment ago. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Now this is interesting, the response they pick up stones to stone him. Why? Was Jesus just saying, I'm preexistent? Maybe some sort of angel or some sort of preexistent soul? These are ideas that maybe could have been grabbed somewhere out there, you know? That's not what they recognize Jesus to be saying. When Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am, immediately in the minds, of these religious leaders, these Pharisees, would have been the scene at the burning bush. Jesus was declaring himself to be God, one with the Father. He is the I am. And that's the reason they pick up stones to stone him. John 8, 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting when you go to the Gospel of John because this is, this is part of John's theology. This is not just a verse. You don't just go to John 8, 58 and say, oh, look, Jesus referred to himself as the I am. This is embedded in every aspect of the Gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John, we get the I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am uh, the door of the sheep and, and so forth. I'm the good shepherd. All of those I am's of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of John. I am. And then, of course, there's that amazing scene where Jesus is being arrested and they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, I am. Now, we read in English, I am he, which is slightly unfortunate, I am he. It doesn't say I am he, it says I am. And it reminds us that the truth of, Rome, of John eight fifty eight is there all along. Jesus is the I am. He is with us. So this morning, people of God, Hear the name of God. I am. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the greatest devices of the devil is to convince you that God simply is not with you. He's not there. He doesn't care. Or if he does, it's only in some kind of abstract way. That's one of the things that Satan wants us to think is that God is not really imminent with us. He's not really present down with us. The incarnation of Christ, the truth of Christmas, proves that that is an utter lie. 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the people of God proves that that is an utter lie. The I am is with us. We have his presence. And thirdly, as we finish up this morning, we see God revealing his permanence. Look at verse 15. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. As we think about this name, I am, and all that it means We cannot miss the fact that God is declaring himself to be unchanging. He's self-existent. We marvel. He's transcendent, utterly unique when placed alongside of, if you can even say that, all the deities that the world has produced. He is self-existent. His presence is with us. He, he, he loves us. He is kind to us. He's disposed to us in such a way that he would come and be one of us, taking on our nature, and he would send his spirit into the hearts of his people and dwell with us forever in a new heaven and a new earth. But we also need to be reminded of this facet. If we turn the diamond, we need to be reminded of this facet, and that is of his unchanging nature. He is the God of the patriarchs who still live. And this is his name forever, to be remembered throughout all generations. This is who God is. This highlights the point made in Revelation 1.8, where the I am God, Yahweh, says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That is God. He does not change. He is the same then as he is now. This God, our God, does not change like shifting shadows. As James chapter 1 verse 17 says, or Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change, period. Or Hebrews 13, 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is referring specifically to the Son of God, to Christ. God is does not change. You know, I remember when we lived in Edinburgh, the Church of Scotland was convening, discussing all of the LGBTQ issues, and it's been a journey over the last decade, but I'm not, I don't remember precisely what the specific issues were at stake. But one of the arguments that so-called progressive Christians want to argue, want to make, is uh, that, you know, the Spirit has, uh, has, has given us fresh, re- fresh revelation, that we, we, we now see better, more clearly, Uh, regarding the LGBTQ issues. No. God is the same. The God of Leviticus, who said that that is an abomination to the Lord, the God who made them male and female in his own image, the God who said that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God, he says that today. God has not changed his mind. He never changes his mind. He is unchanging. What he said then holds now. It is either our authority or we don't know God as king. We either submit to the word of God as the word of our Lord or we have no right to call ourselves citizens of the unchanging king. God is the same always. And what this tells us is that this is a God we can count on. This is a God whom we can count on at every turn in life, at every wave of culture, every new idea, every progressive movement or reformation of the culture. We can count on this God. We don't have to always go back to the drawing board. We don't have to always go back uh, to the table and and refigure this thing out. It is what it is because I am who I am. God says he is and we can count on him. We can count on him in the issues of our day and we can count on him in the very tiny 
problems and concerns and worries of our daily lives. God is permanent. We can read words inspired by him thousands of years ago and know that he has not changed. We can study our Bibles knowing that we don't need a liberal commentator to tell us all the ways we need to understand it now, vis-a-vis then. We can read God's word and try to understand what did it mean then so that we can know what it means now. What is its meaning according to the inspired authors so that now we can appropriate it and apply it to our own lives as God's people in this century. God has not changed. His will has not changed. His love for us has not changed, and it never will. Change, change, change. Everywhere we look. Our kids are growing up. Lots of change. Our bodies are getting older. Our hairs are turning gray or turning loose or whatever. (laughs) We're getting older and older and older. Everything around us changing. But not so for the I am. Not so for our God. Not so for Yahweh, the God who is, who was. And who forever will be. Put your trust in him today. Not yourself. Not what the world has to offer. Put your trust in the only one who can say, I am. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that We call you Abba. We call you the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are expressions of Yahweh. These are ways of understanding what it means that you are the Lord. I am. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you through Christ and We can come boldly. And we ask you, Lord, in this wicked age, in this day of perversion and inversion, this day of mass idolatry, rejection of your word, hatred of God, love of self, worship of pleasure, Lord, in this age, We know that you are with us. You're with our kids. We need not fear. Just as you told Joshua as he was about to go into this land flowing with milk and honey, this promised land, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be courageous, Joshua. May that be What we hear, Father, may we be courageous and not fall at every turn, caving to the culture, being run over by the godless ideas of this world. Lord, but will we take every thought captive to Christ, the light of the world, the I am, the way, The truth, the life, the bread that we must eat, the water we must drink. Father, we pray that you'd be with us now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. God, that our hearts would be filled with joy that we get to belong to this God and we get to know you, Lord. We pray that our hearts would be overflowing with joy in this. Lord, what a What a gift. What a gift. We pray that we would appreciate it truly and deeply. God, we ask your blessings over us as we leave here today, that the words preached this morning and the words read from the scriptures would uh, be penetrating to hearts and would uh, have a lingering effect as the week goes on. We pray all this 
In Jesus' name, amen. At this time in our service, we're